Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Tom. I'm going to call this meeting to order. We do have a quorum, and also, so everybody realizes, we have uh, Director Milliman on phone. Are you there, Joan? I am here. All right. Can you Thank hear you. me? Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear. Thank you very, Good. very much. Secretary. Like to start off this morning with the uh, <laughs> Pledge of Allegiance, Director Juhan, would you like to lead us in the pledge? I'd like us to take a moment of silence for our veterans and now I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, media. We're. I don't. I don't see the media. Uh, maybe they'll come in in a few minutes. Okay. Now I get a motion to approve the agenda, item four. We've got um, Beth and then Mr. Juhan, second. Uh, any discussion about the agenda? If not, all in favor? Aye. Sorry, we have the ability to vote on that's this right, on the tablets. That's right, that's right, we're using, we're using the, uh, ooh, okay. Vote, use your screen please, vote to approve the agenda. Aye. Push. Push. Yes, sir. Okay. Are no. you going to say yes for both? Yes. There we go. Ten. We're good. Item five approval of the minutes of meeting of July 3rd. 2018, can I get a motion? Okay. Question. Um, as far as the minutes go, uh, Joan gave me a list of Scribners and they were passed on to Whitney, I believe. So since they're just Scribners, I don't have to mention them all, those two pages. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's excellent. Any discussion? Yes. I just want to make sure that on page eight of nine, the SCAC committee meeting has been changed to the correct date is August 27th. Okay. All right. And then I also want to so make correct. sure that Schmidley, on page two of nine, that his last name nine? is spelled correctly. That is S C H M I D L I. Thank you so much. Any other discussion? If none, all in favor? Mm -hmm. Vote, vote. We can also request to speak on screen. Yes. Yes. That's true. We got eight. Joan? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Mine's not working. It's all good. Approved. All right. Item six. Chair comments. Uh, I just have a, a couple of quick announcements. One concerning my future with the board of the Golden Rain Foundation. Um, due to some family issues, I will not be rerunning for uh, the bo this board in the coming year. Uh, I just want to. Let everybody know that that's the situation. So. Next, some good news. Some good news. We have some awards to do today. I'm going to ask Chief Moy to come up. Uh, he has some employee awards to do. Uh, and after that, Brian Gruner will also do uh, some awards. Chief Moy. Good morning, Chair Circle, uh, honorable board members, uh, Tim White, Chief of Security. It's, uh, appreciate the opportunity to be with you today and, and recognize some of our outstanding uh, resident volunteers in the community. The Disaster Preparedness Task Force was organized by Laguna Woods uh, residents back in 1989. 
and consists of volunteers who function under the Golden Rain Foundation and the Security Department. Their purpose has always been to educate, inform, and prepare our community for any uh, disaster that may occur. Now, prior to 2016, the task force held their own meetings, published and maintained a series of articles on disaster preparedness, offered residents free disaster training, which they, of course, still do today, and made emergency supplies available through the disaster preparedness office. And uh, I'd encourage all our, our residents to take a stroll right outside uh, the boardroom, and, and we do have that office open, and, and they can prepare themselves for any type of event. Uh, for, for years, these residents were the trailblazers who laid the groundwork in disaster preparedness for Laguna Woods Village. It has been their dedication, expertise, and persistence in looking out for the welfare of this community that has made it such a powerful impact and such a noteworthy cause. You only need to turn on the evening news to see what's going on up and down this fine state of ours and, and the fires and how important it is to be, to be ready and, and prepared for what uh, could happen. Knock on wood, we certainly don't want that to happen here. When I arrived in 2016 and attended my first meeting, it was attended by a small group of, of resident volunteers. This past meeting on July 31st, we had a full room including 11 board members representing GRF, 3rd, United, and Mutual 50. Uh, we would not be where we are today without this uh, group of volunteers who stepped forward so many years ago. So with that little bit of history, I'd like to recognize these individuals uh, for their dedication and their commitment uh, and for those who have unselfishly served this community for many years in disaster preparedness. Uh, Chair, if you don't mind, I'd like to call them up and have you come and take a picture with them. Outstanding. So in, in alphabetical order, uh, Trish Cassidy, Joanne Foster, Marie Gates, Doug Gibson, Lori Gibson, Kathleen Matthews, Jim Rydell, is Jim here? Um, and Tom Soule, and a few that are not with us here today is Betty Rockefeller, Ernie Sensor, Bob Tucker, Robert Yates, and and we lost Paula Page, I think it was earlier in the year, who was just a, um, a committed member of this disaster preparedness. And I, I believe she was the president for several years, so she is certainly missed. But I just want to recognize this outstanding group who have uh, committed themselves to uh, preparing this community. Uh, can we get a round of applause? Very thankful to each and every one of you for everything you did for this community. Can you look at me for a minute? Oh, just one more. Thank you. And straightforward together. One, two, three. One, two, three. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Next up is Brian Gruner. Step forward, please. Thank you, and uh, good morning, uh, Board of Directors, uh, President. Um, today, we would like to recognize and honor um, one of our lifeguards that has um, not only saved one life, but two lives, um, actually, over the last uh, year and a half or so. Uh, one in particular happened in January of, t of 2017, and the other one happened um, just in July um, of this year. And he's done an outstanding job. Um, he's very attentive, uh, reacted to the situation, jumped in, and, and saved this person's life um, once again. So we want to recognize Emilio Bastardo and Dan Brunaski. Oh, you're here. Oh. That's Trish, and there she is, one of the people that he saved. So, well, if you, if you wouldn't mind coming up, too, that would be great. <coughs> yes. So this Recognition of Excellence Award goes to Emilio Baserto, whose outstanding uh, heroics and rescue techniques saved the lives in Laguna Woods Village. So Emilio, thank you so much for your dedication and service, your commitment um, in, in, in doing what you do best, and, and that's being attentive and saving lives. So thank you so much. Okay. And of course, on behalf of the board, thank you, young man. Great. Appreciate it. Step up. Thank you. 
Let me know. Here's your box. This is just some examples of some resident employees or employees in general, the job they do for us every day. Uh, I'd like everybody, and especially the people at home, the next time you see an employee, thank them. Okay, um, VMS report. I don't see uh, Lucy, so I'm going to ask Brad to... Uh, Give the VMS report. Well, thank you very much. The VMS board's been uh, been very busy uh, dealing with a number of matters, but uh, in particular reviewing uh, health care insurance costs, uh, employee uh, compensation, uh, human resources policies and procedures. They're very uh, very active. They recently updated their strategic plan and we're moving forward on those initiatives. Maybe one of the biggest ones there is, is to really increase uh, communication uh, all the way around between departments, uh, between uh, board members and, and employees and, and residents uh, and employees as well. So we're really uh, pushing the envelope on that. You wonder sometimes if you're sending out too much information um, yesterday, many of you probably noted, we sent just a quick little blurb out because there was smoke everywhere. It was kind of hard to tell sometimes where it was coming from, so we just let everybody know, hey, uh, it's not here. You're safe. Don't worry about the fire. Um, uh, now, I live a little uh, east of here, and so maybe more than a little. By the time I got home, my house, my cars, everything was covered uh, in suit, so I think the fire was moving away from us. Uh, not towards us, but it's nice to share that with, with residents. Um, this is uh, budget time, and the boards have been very, very busy, and I'll thank you tomorrow, but I want to thank you again today for your hard work. Um, your preparation, hard work, and policy guidance makes budget preparation pretty easy. Um, and so we will uh, start tomorrow, you're first in line, the GRF budget uh, uh, hearing, which will be televised, is tomorrow at 1.30 in this very room. Uh, United is Thursday at 1.30. And then on Friday at 9.30 in the morning, we will have uh, the third board uh, here for their budget uh, deliberations, which will also be televised. So we look forward to, to uh, uh, a fruitful session later this week and adoption of, of budgets that will allow us to continue uh, the great efforts we've been working on the last few years. And again, I, I thank those in the community who participate as advisors and also come to hearings and meetings and give their input in terms of priorities and projects that we should consider. Um, we had a great grandparents fun day last weekend, had about 500 or so uh, residents uh, and their grandkids show up. Uh, I'm told everybody had a blast and uh, we look forward to doing that, that again. It was kind of a hot day, it's, well, it's been hotter than heck, um, but to have 500 people show up outside in the heat's a pretty good uh, feat. Uh, and so I, I certainly uh, thank the volunteers and our recreation staff who worked hard to put that on for our residents and their grandchildren. Um, since it has been so hot, you know, we started this a week or so ago, we've been uh, showing movies during the day, so the folks, uh, many of whom maybe not have air conditioning or perhaps they just don't want to run it, full bore all day to come over to the Performing Arts Center and, and watch movies in the hottest part of the day. And we've been, we've been drawing four or 500 people uh, a day on this. And so yesterday we had three movies and, and a pretty good crowd. I'm, I'm told that we have exhausted the supply of popcorn in South Orange County. There is none left. And so now we're happy to go to LA and, and Riverside counties to procure popcorn um, for our residents, which I, I'm told we've done. And so starting at one this afternoon, our Beat the Heat uh, movies will be a, uh, a Indiana Jones trilogy marathon. And so you can start watching Indiana Jones at one and, and maybe not conclude till seven or eight tonight. So, um, and we'll have lots of lemonade and iced tea, popcorn, and usually a cold snack, popsicles and things just to 
to keep people cool in this warm weather. So I, I certainly invite all our residents to come out, watch a movie, have a good time. Uh, we keep it pretty chilly in there. Um, and uh, I think, uh, again, thanks staff uh, and, and, and our board member volunteers who have helped as well. Um, you probably notice a lot of work going on out in the community, and we just completed gatehouses 11 and 12. Uh, that's the remodel and refurbishment of those, removing the dry rot, uh, you know, putting in modern uh, LED lights and air conditioning, getting those units, the technology inside, so they can accept the technology we're going to construct outside for the gate arms in the next uh, couple of months. So. Those are ready. Uh, you should see gate four uh, begin construction in the next day or two if it hasn't started already. And so that will be uh, the last of the gate house remodels. If you recall, previously we kind of were in the habit of rebuilding the things at about you know 500 to a million a piece. Uh, these rehabs cost about 20 grand, 25 grand. They're, it's very inexpensive and it's just as functional uh, as building a new one. So it's huge savings for the community. I think it has a better historic look to it anyway. Some of these smaller, kind of more rustic uh, gatehouses has more character. And so uh, we're very proud uh, to be able to do that at such an economic price. And then putting the gate technology in, we'll just uh, finish it off. Uh, all those plans have been submitted to the city. I shouldn't say all those plans because uh, 10 and 11 are not part of this uh, first group. So they are not being submitted to the city now, but will be submitted later. Uh, this group includes, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine, and 14. There we go. So that's the group that we're working on in the next probably six months or so to get the gate arms up, and then we'll follow that up uh, with, with 10 and 11 shortly uh, thereafter. You might have saw some other gate work going on. We we're tinkering with some security gates there uh, leading up to the maintenance service center on El Toro. So you, you might have seen some work going there. Most of that work, uh, there's another gate to be uh, constructed. There's also a, a gate at RV lot B um, that is being planned, but those are in next year's budget. Um, we may indeed ask for an early release after you adopt your budget so we can move forward with, with that, so we can secure that, that service center. Uh, a discussion we do have to have about that is there is some uh, resident vehicular access that goes through there, and so we'll have to talk about when and how much and, and, and what conditions we continue to allow that, but um, that's a debate that in discussion we'll probably have. I'm guessing at the at probably the security uh, committee is probably the logical place to have that. Um, Pickleball as well has been submitted uh, to the city and those plans are under review, we anticipate uh, being released and construction to start uh, on that shortly. Uh, Clubhouse 4, again, we're in break from Meredith's program, so this is the time when we can actually do work there and there's a lot of work going on. It's been painted, uh, we put the new roof on the kiln room, new kilns are being installed. Um, that was a, a very, very poor situation there in that if any of you are potters, um, that, uh, that kiln room was in very bad shape. The, the, the roof was failing and, and the kilns themselves were actually fa failing. We we're getting some pretty bad results for many of our artists. And so this has been a project that's been in the works for a couple of years. And the, uh, little did I know, kilns are kind of hard to come by especially big ones. They're, they're kind of custom manufactured and you got to order them and it takes a long time to get them and well, guess what? They're, they're here and, so, and, and about ready to be installed. So we're very, very excited about that. Uh, again, if you remember, we, for the first time in its life, we tented that uh, clubhouse uh, the last year and then coming back now, getting rid of some dry rot uh, and, and painting, the place looks wonderful. Again, just some of many projects that are going on over there right now. If you, if you stop by, you'll see uh, what I'm talking about. We also, by the way, uh, tented Clubhouse 3, or the Performing Arts Center, whichever you choose, um, for the first time in its life uh, last week. And that was a pretty big tent. You could have had a pretty good, uh, pretty good Boy Scout roundup in that tent. It was a really big tent. And so that's been done and kind of a, a precursor to some of the other maintenance work that's in your budget for next year. And so uh, first things first, that was, that was handled. You also probably uh, 
will notice that there's a lot of paving and slurry sealing going on. I know it's horribly inconvenient uh, for residents, uh, and um, we try to do it as thoughtfully as possible, but it, it never fails that somebody has difficulty getting to their manor uh, or has to park too far away. So if you have those kinds of problems, if you'd call resident services, we will make accommodation for you. Uh, if that means coming and, and picking you up in a golf cart or finding a, an alternative parking place, uh, whatever we can do to, to get you through that, because it only happens every, every four or five years to you, but I know when it's your turn, it's not pleasant. So please give us a call and, and we'll be glad to help uh, in any way we can. Um, it's so hot right now, it's not surprising. We have so many air conditioning pro problems in the community and so many projects to replace them. And so this building uh, is slated for this year as well as Clubhouse 6. And then for next year's budget, the Performing Arts Center is slated for replacement as well. Um, these air conditioning units are quite expensive. They don't last forever. And when they fail, um, it is very tragic for the residents who have events planned. And I know we had uh, a weekend, oh, it's been probably three weekends ago, where we had three clubhouses, uh, well, actually, the community center and two clubhouses fail on the same Saturday. They always fail on Saturday. They won't fail during the week when we're all here. Um, and so uh, we had to really put forth a lot of effort to get that uh, those back up and running, and, and we had full activities scheduled all over the place. So um, getting those replaced is, is you know, high on our list. Um, the old uh, shuffleboard courts over at... Uh, Clubhouse 2 Annex, you know, they sat there deteriorating for 20 years or so, and we got took them out, and now we're putting some landscaping in there. That will start very shortly and should be a nice addition uh, to that area with a couple of picnic tables and, and really a grassy area. It uh, should be uh, well used during the many, many events that we have, uh, uh, particularly fireworks or wood stock. You can think of the big events we have at Clubhouse uh, to our Christmas event. Um, we're always running short of space, and so that will be a nice space for people to, you know, throw a chair or a blanket down and, and enjoy the festivities. So we look forward uh, to that. You might have noticed uh, the manor alterations construction has started in this building. Uh, that's in the old spruce room. Is that right? Yes. Um, and so Currently, manor alterations is in resident services, and it's really inappropriately housed there. Those interactions are quite lengthy and detailed, and to have somebody standing up there, uh, you know, for 20, 30 minutes, uh, throwing plans out on the counter, it's just not really the right way to do it. And so we're, we're moving that operation over to this other room here in the building where people can sit down, lay out their plans, and guess what? They can make an appointment, too. Um, again, those a lot of times they're bringing a contractor or a design professional with them, and so to have that occur in with with residents who are getting rather you know brief interactions with staff for quick service, it's really disruptive. And so we think this is going to be a great enhancement uh, for residents who want to make improvements uh, to their unit, and, and we certainly look forward to to bringing that to you. And then. A uh, couple of just notifications. You may have noticed if you live in the gate 5-6 area or drive down Ridge Route that there's a lot of landscape removal occurring there. Um, that area along Ridge Route um, adjacent to some of the commercial properties there is really quite a nuisance, an attractive nuisance actually, for vagrants and others who might on occasion try to come into our community and wash their clothes or take your bike or do other things that we don't want them to do. And, and that, that sort of forest there provides a nice hiding spot for them. And so uh, it is a third property under easement to the city. And so uh, we are going in there and cleaning that out. The larger trees will remain. A lot of the brush will be removed. Uh, and then we'll have a height of maybe 10 feet uh, so we can see the wall at all times. Once all of that vegetation is removed, shepherd's crooks will be installed to a height of seven feet to prevent uh, those kinds of entries, unauthorized entries into our community. So you'll see that going on. It'll be going on for a month or so, maybe longer, uh, as we clean that area up and then install uh, perimeter security fencing. And then also a, a kind of a, a little bit similar project is we have and are under 
actually order from the uh, Orange County Fire Authority uh, to remove a lot of thick vegetation along the perimeter uh, of the community, primarily uh, on the west edge uh, of the community. And so we'll have crews starting um, August 16th out there, and they'll be working for a couple of months uh, removing all this uh, dense vegetation that's accumulated there. It's been probably seven years since any of that's been cleaned up. And so it really, it really has to, uh, to be removed to keep our community safe. I know it, uh, it's somewhat of a distraction um, to ha put our resources to work there, but I mean, protecting our community is our first priority. And so that, that has to be done. I do wanna uh, give a shout out to the third board for taking these two projects on. It's just, you know, it's one of those things you know you need to do and, and uh, no one's ever taken it on and this board decided to take it on. I, I think they, they uh, enjoy, uh, should receive our praise for that. And then lastly, I just want to share that you've probably noticed that the city has begun construction uh, on the dog park, the new dog park, which is uh, not adjacent to manners in our community, which should be a positive. And uh, we've worked closely with them. And as you know, but maybe, maybe the community doesn't know uh, that this board uh, facilitated the construction of that facility uh, through an agreement with the city on land that, that technically you own. And so um, I wanted to thank you for doing that. I know many of the, uh, the dog lovers in our community and, and surrounding environs will be very pleased uh, when that facility is complete. So with that, that completes my report, and I would certainly entertain any questions or thoughts the board has. I'd like, if I could, uh, you, you mentioned the fire situation. <clears throat> I have quite a challenge <clears throat> at my house with pine trees and the needles fall down. That is a fire hazard if you have a fire started. So what I do is I rake that away. Just something for you to consider for saving your property. Rake those things yourself. Don't take you but a few minutes. And then our landscape people will pick those up. I remove them from the house. That way it, it saves your house from catching on fire. I know what I'm talking about. I only did this for 31 years. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Brad. Uh, a lot of very, very good information. A lot of projects going on. Kudos to everyone who's working hard every day for us. Uh, Item nine, open forum. Three minutes per speaker. At this time, the speakers may address the board of directors regarding items not on the agenda and within the jurisdiction of the board of directors of the Golden Rain Foundation. There is a maximum time limit of three minutes per speaker, and the speaker may only address the board once during this period. Uh, of course, we reserve the right to limit the total amount of time allotted in an open forum if there's a, a, a whole lot, but we should be fine today. Uh, first speaker we have, uh, I have uh, Richard Snyder. Or Chris, Chris Collins. Chris Collins. Chris is first. Come on up, Chris. Thank you and good morning. Um, I'm Chris Collins, 3306Q. I'm here representing the foundation of Laguna Woods Village. Eat carrots or leave a legacy. We, are, we have all heard the myth that eating carrots will improve eyesight. Unfortunately, this is only a myth, and aging sometimes brings with it failing eyesight, be it from glaucoma, macular degeneration, stroke, or other conditions. One of the village, village's past residents, Dr. Adeline Bonin, did experience vision problems, and when she passed away, a bequest in her memory was left to the foundation of Laguna Woods Village, and those funds are now helping pre uh, uh, present residents and, and, and meet their vision challenges. Some of those funds now help residents using braille services to buy needed equipment. Some were used to purchase talking books for the library, the village library, and most recently will be used to purchase large print books for the library. Legacy funds do make a difference. They help the foundation of Laguna Woods Village meet both ongoing and unmet village needs. The foundation would like to acknowledge the contribution of past and recent legacy donors, donors both living and, and past, who have remembered the foundation in their wills, trusts, estates, or annuities. The foundation is very grateful for their support. The legacy donors, donors include Elsie DeLucia, VJ and Cleo Dennis, Hildegard Titian, Adeline Bonin, 
Lawrence Garvin, Marsha Brown, Elaine Lerner, Marion Schlesinger, Bonnie Sullivan, Ralph Reinhard, Erwin and Marcella Levy, Isabel Biggins, Samuel Leibowitz, Leslie McHenry Adamson, Sarah and Jerome Lederer, Annie Peterson, Deanna Hampshire, Gladys Kennedy, Wilma Ledden, Ruth Belson, and Jane, Ruth Jane Robichaud. If you would like to leave or become a, a legacy den donor, we suggest that you first contact your tech, tax per, financial, excuse me, I can't read today. You can please um, first contact your, your tax, financial, or legal advisor about any IRA related or estate planning actions, or you can contact the Foundation of Luna Guna Woods at 949-268-2246, or the Foundation at, at comline.com. Thank you so much for the ongoing support that the, the, the Foundation of Laguna Woods gets from all these various sources. Thank you, Chris. Next up, uh, Richard Snyder. Yes, there is. Okay, hello. My name is Richard Snyder. Uh, my wife, Sue, and I live in 9070 Ronda Sevilla. We've been here a little over five years now. The issue that I'm coming today with is, as you can see, my body doesn't have good mobility. And I've been using these scooters. I have a couple of them. I keep one in the back of the van, and I keep one at my porch, and ride the one from my porch to the van. I can get in the van. I drive okay. Uh, on the first of this month, I got a courtesy warning because I've been using the power in the carport to keep this charged. I've got to keep them charged, and otherwise I get stranded. And um, I came to the community center and checked what could I do about that. Um, someone said, well, you need to get a golf cart sticker. Um, this device really doesn't draw very much power. Um, I probably would spend maybe $4 a month if this was the only thing I was charging. Um, so he said, well, you got to get a golf cart sticker or come to a board meeting and make a request. And the request is, how can I keep this charged by using that power or I can't get it in the house. I don't use it in the house and I, I don't have an extension cord that goes through the door. Um, so I guess it's really a question for you. Can I use that power with my, I mean, we pay over $750 a month comes out of our account for homeowners association dues. Um, would that be a right that I would have to use that electricity power coming from my carport? Or what, what is a better solution? I guess it's a question. Yes. Yes. Thank you for, for coming in. Um, this is likely a mutual issue and not a GRF issue. Do you live in United, did you say? Yes. Um, the United Board, I, unfortunately, we don't really have policies for this, so it's something we'd have to probably take up with the board. But um, you do not have a right to use that power um, uh, independent of getting permission from the board. And, and that permission usually comes in the form of some sort of fee or and then some sort of sticker that would identify you as someone who's paid that fee. And so I will, I will make sure the United Board is, is aware. We, obviously, that doesn't draw much power. And right. So it's about uh, not as much as a golf cart. Under or, two kilowatt hours. Or, and yeah. If I'm in, one of you can correct me. I want to say for a golf cart, 240. 240 and what's the electric PV? It's a little more, isn't it? Same, Same thing. So I suspect this would be quite a bit less than the 240. Oh. Yeah. And could I get someone to cut a mailbox hole in my door and then I could so run So what I'll do is I'll have our folks uh, analyze uh, what it takes to charge that and then we'll make a recommendation to the board. In the meantime, in the meantime, if you go with Chris right here, Chris, would you raise your hand? Would you give this gentleman some sort of temporary permits until we work out what the details are on this? 
and, and then we'll figure that out. All right. It's great. Yeah, but it won't be through this board. It'll be through the United board. It's the president's right here. It's up to United. Okay, it's up to United. I understand. We have the, the reason you were told to, to contact them because this is written in the golf cart information. And if you own a golf cart and you want to charge it, it says here you, you must obtain a decal. That is the reason for that. So now the boss man is trying to straighten it out for you. And you know, this is wonderful. We're going to be talking about this today. So this is good information. And let me tell you, it is important that if you've got a golf cart or you have something like this that has to be charged, get the information from property services. And I'm going to try to have them also get a copy. I'm going to try to get it from the city to have the golf cart information as well as the one from Chief Moy about the uh, rules and regulations and safety. So I will be talking more about this, and this is very important. This is the reason you were told that. Okay, sir? Okay. Okay, thank you. The and Chris is right behind you. Chris, raise your hand again there, and she will uh, give, you, give you a short-term solution, okay? All right, so I, I go ahead and plug it in until they tell me. She'll, she'll talk. Yes, go ahead. All right. Good. I feel safe. I feel much safer. Thanks. Okay, next up is Anita Robertson. Okay, good morning everyone and thank you for having me here and I hope that we can kind of help me resolve an issue, not just for me, but for everyone in the village, really. I live at 231G, uh, close to the creek. I have a small dog. I walk her there every day. And during the last few months, the size and the amount of the large breed dog has increased incredibly. We have German Shepherds there with small ladies my size and under walking them and they're lurching at us. And I'm not close to them, but believe me, it makes you feel very uncomfortable. And this one lady with the new black German Shepherd keeps pulling on it and saying, leave it. Leave it. I mean, how does that make you feel and the other people around? Anyway, uh, we have Dobermans. We have a pit bull that the lady unleashes down at the edge of closer to where the creek comes out of the, close to Valencia. Okay? Let's it run. I, I mean, it's like, what are you doing? You know, and are there any restrictions size-wise to the dogs that are allowed here in our village? I've lived here 13 years, and this, I mean, now we have, oh, we have a Brindle Great Dane size one that the, yanks the owner around. I mean, when dogs see each other, you never know what their gonna reaction is going to be or anything, but please, I think it's, really to the point that I would hope the board would have some restrictions on the size of animals, dogs that are allowed in here, as they do in a lot of, you know, different homeowner associations. 20 pounds is fine. Over that, some of these owners that are older than I can't control these dogs or don't seem to be able to. I don't know where these people live, but I know they're, sometimes they even walk down to the creek. I don't know where they live, but they're there a lot because it's a nice place. Help me, please, or all of us. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the next one is... Subpoena whom? Yeah. Subpoena. Mr. Chair, it might be nice to remind folks that these are uh, very sensitive mics, and so you need to stay about six inches away. Not a foot, but six inches. <laughs> How much is six? I That's your You're good. fine. You're good. <laughs> so my name is Subpoena Hum, and we new residents here in Laguna Woods. We hired a house 
And before we did the contract, I asked uh, many times if my husband can have the commercial car in the community because we know there is places cannot have commercial car. So this is the job of my husband. He, he works 24-7 uh, as a locksmith and he cannot have the car after six o'clock not to be with him because if a baby or an adult or somebody is stuck in the house, he needs to run there and he doesn't have time to go to the office to take the car and come back. So uh, please, it was my dream uh, really to live here in this uh, community. And I will uh, like uh, to have approve uh, the car to be with him and we will cover and we'll do, we'll do all what it's need to do to be uh, secure and uh, private and uh, you know, everything it's need, just we didn't know and we already signed and we, we already paid and I want to be here very much. So please help me with this. Uh, they told me I have a letter from my owner. Uh, she gave me and I believe she say, told us that also she gave uh, you guys uh, a letter, but I don't mind you to have the letter from her. Please help us. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Nadine Messer is next. Good morning, everybody. My name, name is Nadine Meiser, Unit 3071B. And actually, I'm just really here to thank all of you for your, um, I guess your vision and your um, recognition about the energy infrastructure within all of the village. And most importantly, I now with the combined energy task force, um, I really see some good things coming forward. And my husband will be speaking too, so I don't want to take too much time other than to uh, acknowledge um, a lot of work that does need to be done as far as our energy infrastructure assessment and um, applaud you for doing a short-term and long-term plan. Um, my husband and I just recently bought a plug-in vehicle and um, it has drawn more of our attention to the need that surrounds that, that issue. But again, thank you and I appreciate all the work that you do. Thank you very much. Alfred's next. Good morning all, um, board members, as well as uh, those at home watching on your TV set. My name is Alfred Meisner, 3071B as in boy. Uh, I'd like to first of all uh, just say a quick thanks to Bert. I know he's been carrying the flag on electrical issues in the, uh, the village here for many years now. And uh, we're newbies having attended one recent uh, energy meeting just last week. And uh, there were a number of individuals there that have been fighting this battle for uh, some time. And uh, I want to compliment all of those involved in the energy meeting that we attended, uh, all very well versed in the issues and all doing great work. And uh, we asked how we could uh, be of help. And they said, please go to the boards and tell them your story because I'm sure more and more people will be having the same story. Um, it all started the other, it seems like the other day, but it was about a month ago when we first brought our car home and I plugged it into the uh, outlets in our carport. And of course we had our sticker, we had already gone to uh, the administration building and they had fixed an electrical sticker because as we know, uh, you do have to pay for that uh, privilege. And we were all excited because we had actually gotten a letter from Tesla to come in and order your new Tesla. And we don't drive much, and we thought it was a little bit much, so it got us going to look at other cars. And so, make a long story short, we picked up this nice new plug-in hybrid. And uh, the first time I plugged it in, four times the uh, circuit breakers went out. So I did realize that we had old circuit breakers. And so this is obviously the reason why the a newly combined Village Energy Task Force is pursuing uh, these issues because um, we're really happy with our new car. We're saving quite a bit of money of gas. Living here at the Village, our biggest uh, costs are really our electrical energy and then our gas purchases. And so any way you can reduce those for us 
as well as many of the other people living here in the community, I think it will pay long-term dividends, not only to their budgets, but also to the environment. So I applaud all of those that are involved. I ask you to continue to support the directions of the uh, Energy uh, Task Force and uh, anything I can do to help uh, I'll, I'll volunteer and ways to help support the cause. So thank you again. Thank you. Next up, Mary Wall. Good morning, my name is Mary Wall, and I thank you for all your hard work. You're all here today, except Joan. Um, the administration building uh, is not in Laguna Woods Village. It's not in the Gator community. It is owned by Laguna Woods Village. But we don't own the land, as far as I know, and we don't own the parking lot. We have to pay for the parking in the front of the building. In the past two years, millions of dollars have been spent on this building. The fitness center, the boardroom, as you can see, re huge renovation. Channel 6 TV studios, always something new every time I switch on the TV. Several of the rooms have been renovated and moved, and we're still going to have more rooms renovated and moved. Why? Who knows? More money is budgeted, 1.4 million for a building which is not in the Laguna Woods Village. The needs of the residents should be taken care of first before the wants of the building. The residents have not got a seven-day fixed bus route. Every amenity has seven days, the availability. There is no bus route for the residents here. All these improvements are being made and taken care of except the bus service. I don't know when you're going to listen to the residents here. We're not getting any younger. And one of these days, we'll all need the buses. Thank you very much. Thank you. Last but not least, Maxine McIntosh. Good morning, good morning. <clears throat> I was so happy when I arrived today. Looking forward to another good board meeting with all these people in charge and such a good CEO giving us a comprehensive report that I never heard the first 18 years I lived here. So I was really looking forward to it. Till Tom Circle, our president, made his announcement that his life is going in a different direction. We can't knock that, but he will not be available to run again for the board. You know, I'm always, as I'm sure all of you are, trying to encourage more people to come to our board meetings, and come to committee meetings. And what I tell them is, this year, I say, you know, we're so lucky. All three of the large um, uh, board, boards of directors meeting in this room have really good leadership. Presidents who are courteous to everyone, they listen to what you say. They encourage their fellow board members to respond if you have questions, if they're able to at that time. And I, I encourage them, and I say, come. It's, just, it's different from what it was last year for this board, I know. It's wonderful, marvelous. And now we're losing Tom Circle, my favorite president in a long time. Well, Tom, you're really appreciated. You've done wonderful work here. And I've always felt the most important responsibility of the board president is running the board meeting each month. That's the, to me, that's always been the number one responsibility, run a good meeting. He's done it every time. You know, I was at an Alzheimer's meeting at the um, Senior Center earlier last week. I go to a lot of Alzheimer's meetings. I've been to big ones. I'm going to the big one at the Marriott Hotel next month. There'll be a 1,000 people there to just be up to date with what's going on. And again, it was being stressed that not only do we need mental stimulation, but we need different kinds of mental stimulation. Doing the same thing in the same way every day doesn't really keep those new brain cells growing. And we're so lucky we've learned that new brain cells can grow. And so I got up. There was a good crowd there. And I said, come to the board meetings. They're different every month. I said, sometimes the agendas are over 100 pages. And you can pick it up ahead of time. Pick up the agenda. Study that. That'll keep your brain going. And uh, I got an applause, but I don't know if anybody's here. 
from that meeting, two people maybe, huh? So I just want you to know how much I appreciate Tom's leadership and what has been going on here in this room all this year. You'll be missed, Tom, and thank, thank you all. Thank you, Maxine. <clears throat> okay. Well, uh, Mr. Hudson is taking care of Richard, it appears. Um, Annette, you, would you like to address the dog issue uh, at the creek? Huh. To Anita? We are going to have a security meeting on Monday, August the 27th, and I will put that matter on the agenda because I just noticed in my neighborhood, I don't even know what type of dog there is, but there's a monstrous white dog that somebody, you now he knows he needs to have a leash, but what he does is he takes the leash and he puts it around the dog's neck very loosely, like in a, in a fold position and lets the dog run. And I'm not very secure with that either. And I didn't know how to address it. So obviously you've helped me with that, but we will put it on the agenda and we'll see what can be done. Brad, did you have anything you wanted to say about that? Yeah, I mean, GRF can, institute rules regulating uh, pets on your property, but really the kind of question that was raised is a mutual issue in terms of what kind of uh, pets a mutual is going to allow in the community. I, I don't want to speak for the boards, but I, I, I think they would be hesitant to start naming breeds and, and sizes that would be acceptable or not acceptable. And uh, But I'm sure all those board members have heard the comments and, and perhaps stricter enforcement of the rules we have in place now um, would solve this problem rather than new rules, but I, I leave that up to the, to the mutual could, boards to decide. Could I ask one question? Uh, you know, some insurance companies, before I moved to the village, uh, on a regular house, they would not insure if you had like a pit bull or a Rottweiler or an Akita or any of those things. We have tiny little patios. We hardly have any grass area except, you know, it's, it's Again, kind uh, of important, yeah, that I think the safety of all. Just overall, they have restriction at the towers. I have friends that live there. They have dogs. It's, it's restricted inside, and that's all it takes. Leave the ones that are okay here, but for the future, have some kind of a, a restriction on the size of the animals. I'm not, they really do make you feel uh, really you know, in fear sometimes. Again, that'll be taken up by, Thank by you. the mutuals. Thank you. Thank Excuse you. Excuse me, if I might. I think the ADA better be contacted before we make any decisions on that because <clears throat> I had a dog that it was necessary to have for a period of time, and he was about 75 pounds. That would be very restrictive. And having been an insurance investigator, I don't know what insurance company would stop you under the ADA, ma'am. Again, that'll be the, a discussion of the mutual boards and not this board. Okay, um, anyone else? Oh. I have a quest button. <laughs> Judith. Judith. Okay, I know. I'm not used to these buttons. We I'm haven't still... used them for so long. Um, I want to respond to Mary Wall about the uh, buses and the problems we're having. I don't. I think you were at the last meeting on August 1st, but we have set a date for the special meeting, August 31st, 9.30 a.m. here in this boardroom. It'll be advertised in several different venues. Uh, Joan's going to put it in the breeze, correct, Joan? Um, and then, um, thank you. So uh, we are going to address those things in the thing, you know, it'll be a meeting just for that one agenda item. Thank you. Uh, I'll respond a little bit to uh, Nadine and Alfred. We are very excited about the Energy Committee and we will support their recommendations. Um, so keep working with them. Uh, I know the plug-in situation is a problem and we will be addressing it as aggressively as we can. Thank you for your input and your willingness to serve uh, with members of this board. Yes, go ahead, uh, Annette. Okay, this is um, actually going back to the, um, the buses. I have a friend that just moved into uh, Leisure World Rossmore, and she just advised me that uh, 
she had given up driving at 55. So she, her buses are really critical for her there too. And you know, the older that we all get, there is change. And she just said that uh, starting in 2019 there, they don't have their own bus system, but they do have the OC, I guess, access that comes in. But now it will only be coming in in 2019, their bus routes on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. They will only have bus routes in 2019, three days a week. And I think I only bring, I only bring that up just to, sh just to really reiterate that there is change. And I feel our CEO, I feel Judith Troutman, I feel like all the people in this community have been working very, very hard to try to take this topic and run with it. It's a very expensive for our community, and we're trying to give everybody the best service we can, and there's many things we're trying to do. And I just wanted to bring that up because I was really alarmed when I heard that. Thank you. Oh, and then the, I'm sorry. And then the other issue I wanted to just bring up was Zippy Nahum, the resident. I will uh, talk to our security chief on that, okay? I just need... Uh, and he'll give me, with your name, he'll give me your manor number so we can discuss that. Thank you. Good, thank you. Okay. Yeah, the issue with commercial vehicles is, is important. Uh, and we have some rules and regulations already in place. Um, okay. And we'll, I'm sure you will. We, we do, and... Yeah. and um, Basically, the rule is that you're not allowed to have a commercial vehicle yeah. in here, and that is something that, you know, it sounds like you're a resident. Your member should have made you aware of that before they, you signed your lease. Yeah. We make sure that things are adhered to. I will bring this up to the chief to see, you know, just to make us aware, and we'll get yeah. in touch with you. Thank you. I'll be okay. discussing this also, and that's on the notice contractors and subcontractors about because we have a lot of traffic notices of violations because of that issue. And I will be addressing that, <coughs> and we're, we're working on that. Okay, um, that should just about do it, except I will uh, address Maxine and say thank you for your comments. Okay, consent calendar, moving on. All matters listed under the consent calendar are considered routine and will be enacted by the board by motion <clears throat> in the form listed below. In the event that uh, item can, can be removed from the, by, the, by a board member, it uh, shall be subject then to further actions. Uh, a and B, motion to accept the consent calendar. Diane, Annette, any other discussion? If not, all in favor? Approving the consent calendar? We're getting there. Yeah. It's on the consent calendar. That's part of it. Yeah. Okay. Seven, anybody else? Check it, please hit. Joan, can I have your vote, please? Oh, yes, please. <laughs> Thank you, Joan. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Both. It's for 11 A and B to accept A and B. Yeah. yeah. The consent calendar. I'm yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, 11 to zero, it passes. Okay, item 12, unfinished business. Entertain a motion to introduce a resolution to amend the GRF electronic payment policy that went out in July for initial notification. Okay, resolution 90-18. To read it. First. Electronic payment policy. Whereas Golden Rain Foundation of Laguna Woods <coughs> Village GRF has adopted several electronic payment methods over the years. And whereas credit card payments are accepted at several point of sale locations, such as those used at the Village Greens, Resolution 90-11-102, broadband services, 
Resolution 90-12-130, and the Performing Arts Center, Resolution 90-14-01, with the associated merchant processing fees absorbed into operations at these revenue generating operations. And whereas GRF offers an electronic payment method for monthly assessments called Easy Pay, and 70% of Laguna Woods Village members take advantage of this free auto debit service to automatically deduct assessments from their bank account while other members use their own online banking service to generate electronic payments. Both of these low-cost services continue without user fees. And whereas GRF desires to increase electronic payment options for assessments and introduce options for chargeable services. Whereas GRF has initiated a service agreement to process electronic payments via the community's resident portal and in person at the community center, which will be activated once the technology infrastructure is in place. Now, therefore, be it resolved August 7, 2018, that GRF introduces the acceptance of electronic payments for assessments, fines, fees, and chargeable services. And resolve further, for assessments, the prior will be charged a convenience fee equal to an amount necessary to offset all processing fees contracted with the merchant provider. Currently, 2.95% per credit card transaction. And resolve further, fees will be updated as needed based on contractual agreements and passed on to the payer without further resolution updates. And resolve further that resolution 90-18-21, adopted May 1, 2018, is hereby superseded and canceled. And resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of this corporation to carry out this resolution. I so move we approve this resolution. Second, Bert. Any further discussion? No further discussion. Uh, vote on. Uh... Yes. Here we go. Vote electronically, please. Joan? Yes. Good. Yes. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Passes 11 nothing. Item B, entertain a motion to introduce a resolution for the non-return of ID cards. Uh, again, it went out in July for initial notification. Judith? Resolution 90-18, non-return fee of identification card fee. Whereas the Golden Rain Foundation requires that all approved individuals to reside in the village register and carry an ID card with them at all times. Whereas the Resident Services Department issues ID cards and vehicle decals when a resident is approved to reside in the unit. Now, therefore, be it resolved August 7th, 2018, that the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby establishes a fee for non-return of ID cards of $125. And resolve further that the Board of Directors of this corporation reaffirms its non-return fee of $125 for vehicle decals. And resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of this corporation to carry out the purpose of this resolution. I hereby approve this resolution. Second. Diane, any other further discussion? Yes, Annette. Okay, um, there's been a little bit of question on this and I just wanna say that uh, the third mutual lease policy fee schedule uh, we'll be um, amending it at their uh, Tuesday, August 21st, 2018 uh, board meeting to take place here in the uh, boardroom. What we're trying to do is have all of the fees be um, the same. So United has accepted this. We've adopted this. And third, for some reason, it fell through the cracks. So it will be adopted by third this, uh, at this coming board meeting as an FYI. Okay, no further discussion. Can we vote, please? Yes. 
Good, Bert. Here we go. It's approved, 11 nothing. Okay, item C, 12C. Entertain a motion to approve the amended uh, GRF Mobility and Vehicle Committee Charter. Get a motion to approve that. Okay, it's in your handout. Yes, it's in okay. the handout, and I'm sure it's been already been reviewed. Yes. yes. I make a motion that we approve the charter. Can I get a Without reading it? Bert? We have to vote no. whether okay, we don't have to read it. We do not have to read it. It's not a resolution. It's it a says charter. it's a resolution. It, it is, is a resolution. Oh, I'm sorry. It is a resolution. I'm sorry, yes. And, and we have to vote to yeah. not read it. I move that we waive the reading of the resolution 90-11-146. The second to second that waiver. Okay, Joan. Joan, any discussion about yes. the waiver to read it? Okay. We need to vote on the waiver to read it. All in favor? Yes. Okay. Yes. The waiver not to read it. Okay. Now we'll uh, take a motion to approve the new committee charter. You said, didn't it? I make a motion to approve the new committee charter. And Bert seconded it. Um, all in favor? Yeah, or we we okay. got a vote electronically? Yes. <coughs> okay. Item D. Entertain a motion to approve the Disaster Preparedness Task Force Charter. Okay, I move that we waive the reading of the Disaster Preparedness Task Force Charter. Second to that, Annette. All in favor to the waiver of not reading it? Raise your hand, please. Okay, now can we entertain a motion to approve the charter? Bert moves it. I'll second it. We have a second. Any discussion? No, with none. Vote on approving the charter, please. Joan? Yes. Okay. 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 It carries. Okay, that's all of unfinished business. New business, item 13. A, entertain a motion to approve the art affair open to the public. Can we get a motion to approve that? I move. Beth, can I get a second? I would. Jim Juhan, second. Any discussion? Without further discussion, vote on approving the art affair open to the public. Yes. Okay, that's approved. Item B, uh, entertain a motion to approve the proposed Energy Task Force Charter. Can I get a motion to? Again, I move to waive the reading of the Task Force Energy Task Force Charter. Can I get a second for the waiver? Diane, all in favor of the waiver? Not reading it? Yes. Okay. Now we'll vote on entertaining a motion to approve the Energy Task Force Charter. I second. Bert, second Judith. Any discussion? No further discussion. Please vote. Wait, 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 wait. Oh. Mm -hmm. Don Frankel had a comment. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> John Frankel, 3473A. I'm a member of this uh, task force, and United recommended that we remove the word safety in the paragraph, uh, oh, I guess it's in the third paragraph, because that, uh, and uh, the uh, the Energy Task Force agreed and we voted to remove the word safety because it's essentially providing constructive notice that we would be responsible for safety. We're addressing, it's addressing safety, not responsible for safety. We're just addressing safety. I'm just saying the fact that that was what the vote was. 
Okay. On. And they should all be the same. Be the These revisions were made at the energy committee that occurred after this had been sent to print. So you have the corrected versions. The supplement was not distributed. Okay. So it, so the change has already been made. Okay. Yes, sir. Dick Rader, 270D. I have a thought for you. Um, I understand that you don't want to read the very long uh, resolutions, but the people at home have no idea what you're voting on. So I'm just wondering if you would just make a brief statement before you vote on a resolution stating what you're voting on. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Maxine. Yes, a quick question before we get off charters. Um, I don't have a copy of the amended GRF mobility and vehicles charter in my agenda. Right. Were some handed out? They're out there. They're back there, Maxine. It was well, the extra out. We'll get you one. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, Judith. Okay, what the charters, that, uh, the three charters we came with today, normally in every January, every committee uh, reviews their charter. And a charter is a document that defines the relationship between the directors and staff and anyone else who's involved in that relationship. So it's not exactly responsibilities, but you can use that word if you want. And so pretty much these were just reviewed every January, and then it comes to the board for final approval. So we should, we were a little late this year because this new staff wasn't used to presenting them every January. So uh, now we'll watch it a little closer. But that's all the charters are, is just defining the relationship between the parties that work together. Okay, did we vote on the last charter? We need to vote on the last charter after the discussion. Please vote electronically. Yes. Okay, approve 11 nothing. All right, here we go. Item 14, committee reports. We're gonna Start out with the report from the Finance Committee, uh, Director Phelps. Okay. Whitney, I'm ready when you are. <clears throat> okay. The only other resolution that we passed was about the uh, art affair, was just opening that up to the public, and that was all right. Um, okay, so here we go. Uh, let's see, this, these are, we're going to review the June 30, 2018 preliminary financial statements. Slide one, through the end of June, total revenue for GRF was $21,564,000 compared to expenses of $20,864,000, <coughs> excuse me, resulting in net revenue of $700,000. Next slide. This chart shows activity and operations separate from reserve and contingency funds activity. In operations, we had an operating deficit of $239,000 through the end of June after backing out depreciation, which isn't funded through operations. Slide three. When comparing actual results to budget, GRF was worse than budget by $541,000. Slide three shows where there was the most significant variance between actual results and the amount budgeted. The most significant unfavorable variance was the trust facilities fee, which year to date were $293,000 under budget. The fee was raised from $2,500 to $5,000, effective for escrows opened after January 1st, 2018. Most of the receipts in the first quarter of 2018 were from escrows opened in 2017 at the lower amount. Also, the number of resales is lower this year than for the same period last year. Another unfavorable Unfavorable variance was legal fees and arbitration services, which were higher than budgeted by 230,000 for labor issues. Cable programming fees were higher than budget by $176,000 due to increased programming fees on certain contract renewals. And clubhouse rentals and event fees were unfavorable by $138,000 <clears throat> due to lower revenue generating events held at the Performing Arts Center, but a partial offset of that would be found in community events expense. 
We did experience a favorable offset in some categories. Broadband services revenue was higher than budget due to more internet subscribers and set-top box rentals. Other favorable, favorable variances were interest income, which was $136,000 higher than budget, and professional fee expense, which was lower than budget by $121,000 due to lower audit fees and the timing of tax preparation fees. We also have utilities that were 110,000 lower than budget because electric consumption is one, running 21% lower than budget. <laughs> Slide four. On this pie chart, we show, did we get to slide four? Come on. It's a little, it's a little slow this morning. Well, I'll tell you in advance that what it'll be is a pie chart and what we show, there we go, what we show by category, non-assessment revenues received to date of $6,389,000. Our largest revenue operation <clears throat> was broadband services followed by the trust facilities, fees, golf operations, and so forth. Non-assessment revenue helps keep our assessments down. Slide five. Expenses to date of $20,864,000 dollars are shown by category on this pie chart. The largest categories are compensation, cable TV, insurance, professional, and legal, and so on. Slide six, <clears throat> this is the reserve and contingency fund adjusted balances. Um, so starting with the first column on the left, the funds show a combined balance of 27516000 as of the end of June. Included in, the, in this total are contributions received this year through assessments, trust facilities fees, and interest earnings. The second column shows work in progress of 4,301,000, which reflects the amounts paid for projects that are not yet complete. The third column shows the net of the first two columns. The net adjusted fund balances, or you can call them cash balances, of 23,215,000. Although I have to remind you that these funds aren't held, they are held in investments, they aren't uh, sitting in a bank in cash. Uh, if you're interested in where our funds are invite, invested, I invite you to come to the next GRF meeting where we will have BlackRock and um, Merrill Lynch representatives. Slide seven, <clears throat> uh, this is uh, in an effort to give you more meaningful information on our reserve expenditures, we've added this slide a few months ago. It's a summary of our detailed reserve expenditures report. Column one shows we had appropriations of $20,219,000 approved as of June 30th. Included in this figure are all 218, 2018 capital plan items and supplemental appropriations, as well as amounts approved in prior years that were carried over for completion. This figure will increase as GRF approves supplemental appropriations during the year. The second column reflects expenditures as, and is entitled incurred to date or what has been paid since the funding was approved. We can see that $8,098,000 has been booked as of June 30th. This figure will increase during the year as expenditures are made. The final column shows $11,808,000, which is the remaining encumbrances. This is the amount approved by the board for open projects that has not yet been spent. That's it for the slides. Um, I hope the additional detail uh, on our reserve expenditures is helpful, but I remind you that uh, more detail than this is available um, at the GRF Finance Committee meetings at the, uh, and in the agenda packets. Um, we didn't have a July finance meeting, but we were busy working with staff on a 2019, our 2019 budget. I want to remind everyone that we do have a televised report on our budget tomorrow afternoon, Wednesday, August the 8th at 1.30 in the boardroom. Our next scheduled finance meeting will be Wednesday, August 22nd at 1.30 in the boardroom. As I mentioned, we will have representatives from Merrill Lynch and BlackRock there, and they will give a portfolio review of not only GRF's investments, but also United's, Thirds, and Mutual 50s. You're welcome to attend, but if you have any questions that you want to ask in advance, send them to me and, and I'll make sure they get them. Other items on the agenda for our, <clears throat> excuse me, our August 22nd meeting may include a trust facilities fee promissory note, uh, the administration, administ, administ, ad, well, the charges and prepayment options, electronic vehicle charging stations, and reserve expenditures report status update. 
And that's it for the Finance Committee report. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm losing my voice. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. Very, very good report. Report of Community Activities Committee, Director Parrott. Community Activities Committee has lots of activities that happen, especially in the summertime. Two of our really um, important things that we talked about at our last meeting were uh, we voted to have the annual art fair become open to the public. Our wonderful artists have so many beautiful things to sell. And so we, we voted to open it to the public. And thank you, board, for agreeing with that and voting that that really can happen. Grandparents' Day was this Saturday, and it was absolutely fantastic. Concerts on the patio are happening. Black Market Jazz was here last Thursday. It is so much fun to bring a picnic dinner and come and hear a jazz concert. And they were absolutely excellent. It's on the patio in Clubhouse One. Bus excursions are continuing. There's one soon that's going to the Angels game. And a car show connected to a free concert at Clubhouse Two is also coming up. Look in our Recreation Department brochure for all of these upcoming events. And um, we just happen to have a little quickie video for you to show you some of the fun things that are happening with activities in our community. I suspect many in this audience know all too well the sacrifices of these men and women. They remain in our thoughts beyond days like today and they are forever memorialized in our hearts as our family, our friends, and our heroes. Welcome, Laguna Woods Village residents. So yesterday we're here at our second annual 4th of July event, right here in a beautiful clubhouse two at the Village Greens Garden Park area. And we have the very unique opportunity to interview and talk to a family of, you know, of four generations. So I would like to see what brought them out here, why they're here, and how is this so enjoyable for you guys? Well, we had our, uh, our grandchildren are here. My son and his wife are here. They came all the way from Hollywood area. Uh, this is just perfect for the children. Uh, here's my wife, Jody. Hi. And we are just having a blast. And of course, we have the younger one, uh, Mrs. Uh, Sidel Graham. Hello, Sidel. How are you doing? I'm doing great, and it's so much fun to. So you're having a great time here. Oh, wonderful! That is wonderful. great. That is oh. great. Well, that is exactly why we're out here. We want to bring families together. We want to bring the grandchildren bonding with their uh, with the grandparents and bring the whole family out. So, so I'm going to ask the little one a question. Are you having fun? Yes. Yeah. Relax. Relax. Say yes. Relax. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, right, I, 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 I heard it. Do you want to say? Are you having fun here? Yes. All right. Yeah. That's Yay. awesome. Well, thank you guys for coming out. Have a great All time. Right. Enjoy it. And it's going to be spectacular. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was painless. <laughs> so that's the... Community Activities Committee report. Thank you, thank you very much. And I personally, again, heard, hear from residents all the time about the events and how good they are. We got some real dancers in this community. Uh, I was there watching some of the moves and uh, I certainly couldn't duplicate it. Yes, Raina. Question for Beth about when is the next meeting? Because some of the emails said they were conflicts. Oh, good question. I think I've got it written down. It says the 13th, isn't it? Is that right? That's when she. 2 p.m. in the boardroom? 
It says September 13th, according it, to... Uh, that's right. That's right. September 13th. Thank you. Okay. Report of Maintenance Construction Committee, Director Matson. We did not have a meeting last month. However, tomorrow at 9.30... First thing is that we have this project log that, that documents all the major activities here. There are 29 of them, and I'd like to just mention uh, four of them. Um, <clears throat> uh, Brad Hudson sort of uh, mentioned um, about on, on these 29, quite a few of them, does that every time, which is good. He did a great job. He mentioned the gatehouses, 10 and 11. I live in gate 11, and the, the new, the, the refurbished gatehouse there are just excellent. Also, uh, like to mention at uh, Clubhouse 4 in the wood shop, um, I was over there yesterday. The work that has been completed on that, putting a new air conditioning system. Um, I temp there was about six guys in there cutting, working, and uh, in the temperature. This is the time of the year that they shut down the wood shop because it's so hot, because it, it, they, they, the AC wasn't working right, or whatever was there wasn't working. Anyway, I suspect the temperature was probably 75 degrees in there. It was gorgeous. And they were just finishing up, uh, changing out, the, putting in new windows there also. On um, Clubhouse 2, <clears throat> Gate 12, the pickleball area, um, on that, I'm getting a lot of comments on what's the status on that. And right now, uh, we need, we're getting the final construction documents. Once we have those, then we go and get a permit. And then at, um, once we have a permit, then the contractor can come in and give us a construction um, schedule that will tell us when the work will be done. And so um, that may be a couple months from now. I'm not sure, but we'll just have to wait and see until we get that schedule. But um, also, there on, we'll be talking tomorrow about uh, access to the pickleball area. Right now, to get to the uh, pickleball and um, area, you have to walk down this little, almost like a 15-inch um, wide little path that gets down there. And also the golf carts and uh, trucks and cars sh I'll share the rest of that road. So some people are kind of concerned about that. So I put that. I, I, I will be putting that on our agenda tomorrow. See uh, what we want to do about it. Um, and uh, also over in, well, Bert, um, Brad mentioned there's a lot of work in Clubhouse Four. Another one is this kiln he mentioned, and we had a. At, at our last meeting in the, in the closed session, we had a talk, a little talk with about that. Anyway, that's um, work has started on that, and and uh, as uh, Brad mentioned, and it should be completed uh, in October. So, also uh, the uh, Performing Arts Center. I think you'll be making a presentation tomorrow, and um, we'll be talking about Clubhouse Two Video Club expansion. Uh, chemical storage at five pool facilities with PowerPoint presentation. Um, There's one that came up last uh, in our last meeting, West Creek Benches, and that's which is uh, Creeks and Gate 11 area. Um, also, the um, thing that's that's come up when someone goes to the Village Greens for a meal, it usually takes at least 30 minutes to get served when there are a number of people there. And, um, and I, myself and uh, um, Dick, uh, we went over and took a look at the kitchen. The kitchen is small, and I was on this board when that building was built. And that 
um, kitchen was supposed to be for breakfast and lunch only. And so uh, there was a, right at the end when we were finally uh, snuck in the design, uh, some uh, another stove so we can actually do a little bit of dinner work. Well, now it's very popular, popular and popular and a lot of people tend and so especially when it gets really bad, sometimes it takes an hour for uh, someone to be served there, with people sitting around outside there. Now, a way to do that is to expand the north wall on the kitchen, uh, the 19th restaurant, and we'll be talking about that tomorrow. And so that's, uh, uh, let's see, that's all I'd like to say, so thank well, you. Well, I'd just like to comment that I wholeheartedly uh, support that kitchen expansion. It's necessary. It feeds lots of people. Um, I don't know how many people go in there. I noticed over the weekend, at one day they had they had a 90th birthday party going on. At the same time, they had a party of about 30 people doing another on the inside in the dining room. At the same time. Uh, it's amazing how many people are using it for parties, for meals, and uh, we need to expand. We we really need to do that. So uh, I just wanted to say that. Yeah, thank well, you. Thank you for looking into that. We're and going to I have an interesting. Uh, have confidence. And, you'll take care of it. Yeah, and, and we actually have a proposal for solving that problem. That's great. Excellent, Beth. Uh, the PAC report. We did have a meeting and we discussed um, the safety issues that will be addressed. They've already been budgeted and that's going to be happening. We also talked about that the village, village community fund is looking toward people who would like to become a part of that committee and we're looking toward that committee being able to come up with some funding for particular items in the build in the village. And so just to get some more information, we asked the architects to come up with um, some temporary or just sort of figures on what things could, ha could happen in the Performing Arts Center and what would be the approximate cost so that we could talk about that in the Village Community Fund. So that's really an upcoming thing that's going to be happening in September. The architects will be coming back with some just real temporary, broad-based guesses at, at possible um, renovations and the funding for those. That's it. Thank you. Report of the Village Energy Task Force, Director Muldow. Yes. Um, the task force met for the first time and selected its chairman, which is uh, Bill Walsh, and co-chair, myself. Um, and the topic primarily had to do with um, identifying the priorities that we want to give to the consultant that this board had approved us to hire. Uh, we have a $50,000 budget, and we're saying, you know, what, what is the work that we expect from this consultant? And uh, GRF basically presented two very important things. Uh, the first had to do um, with energy for the GRF facilities. We currently take energy off the grid, and we have backup generation at our buildings, uh, but we know that the backup generation is old. We're going to be replacing that backup generation. And before we do that, we'd like to consider the possibility of putting in alternative energy which will be clean energy as opposed to the diesel. And the other thing is we want to look at the possibility of serving the disaster task force. Uh, the disaster task force has to come in and define what levels of energy are going to be required in the various facilities in order to serve the community in the event such a disaster as fire or uh, earthquake um, or even high heat conditions which bring down the grid and when we need alternative energy. Um, it becomes very important. There, we do have a long-term failure. I mean, we're proposing to use these buildings as backup. Uh, there are people in this community that rely upon energy. Uh, there are people that are on dialysis. There are people that 
require oxygen generation. Uh, there are people that require refrigeration for medication. And in all cases, we have to provide some form of energy. Where, but they themselves will have to provide the battery backup. But we would be here to provide charging of those batteries so that they can continue to operate. Um, and of course, we have the issue of excessive heat. Uh, and I have to compliment Brad and the staff for what they did with Clubhouse 3. I think that was very important because you look at what's going on in Europe today. Pe people are dying by the thousands. And particularly in an elderly population, it is critical in this community uh, that we assure that there's always power to our facilities. So one of the things that we are looking at with alternative energy is the possibility that we could independently go off the grid and provide our own power and then use the power company's power as backup because their power lines, their grid lines, their substations are equally uh, subject to failure uh, in the event of earthquakes or in the event of fire. Okay, so that's the direction that we headed. That's number one priority. Uh, number two priority, a little discussion before, uh, is the realization that we're gonna see a lot more electric vehicles in the community. Um, practically every manufacturer of electric cars uh, have, have announced electric vehicles in their line for 2019. And uh, we already have probably well over 150 electric vehicles in our community. And so, and in, in addition, GRF is looking to uh, purchase more electric vehicles uh, for their operation. So this is something that we have to deal with. And what we want to ask the consultant to do is to come up with a strategy of what it is we have to do or can do to best provide energy for the community, particularly for people with electric vehicles. And uh, that's basically the two things we discussed. Bert, is, yes, does that mean you're considering charging stations and where we can put them? That's correct. Thank you. Yeah, both of those are very, very important and uh, go forth. Yeah. I mean, the other thing, you know, we, we have to even, we're going to increase the demand for electricity when we have so many electric vehicles. So it's a question of turning back to SEE and identifying where we need transformers upgraded to provide that energy, because right now those transformers would be totally inadequate. Good, excellent, Bert, thank you very much. Uh, Report of Media Communications Committee, Director Parrott. So Bert just talked about looking toward the future, and it seems like we're doing an awful lot of looking toward the future, which is absolutely necessary. And this committee, which, um, Joan, share, Joan chairs, and she's gone, and I had the privilege of reporting for her. Interesting, media and communication. So it's these two pieces, and guess what? She's got two directors who are just on fire doing things with media and communication. There's so many projects happening w with Eileen Pollan and communication and with Chuck Holland in media that if please come to the media and communications meetings. It's just amazing to see what's happening in our community. And, and the whole, the bottom line idea is how can we reach out to people in the community? How can we communicate with each of our citizens? And how can, how can we facilitate them being able to communicate back to us? So it's a two-way communication. So a couple of things that happened um, at the meeting on July 16th. Director Millman said sh she really hopes we're gonna be looking toward having a new town hall meeting soon, and that is in the works date to be, a date to be established. When Chuck Holland gave his report, a couple of the, th I mean, there's so many things, but a couple of the things that he did mention is this uh, new music lineup on Village Television. I'm sure that um, we've noticed that. The previous con contract expired, so now we've got a new one. And he talked about an update on the contract renewals, and that's something to pay attention to because it's a struggle of what's happening today with um, the cable news channels and how the prices are just going up and up and our folks are having to negotiate to do the best for us. 
Eileen Pollan and her team have been working. You, I know that you, you read The Breeze, and that's one of the biggest things that they work on. And, and the Friday updates, Heather Rasmussen has been contracted. She's been, with, she's been with the village for years and years, and she's now contracted to be a freelancer um, for up to 12 hours a week to update information on our website, to keep our website going. And Director Pollan noted that um, we do have uh, some outside sources that we had con contracted with to work with um, publicity and reaching out Facebook and other, um, and other medias. And we've decided not to continue that contract because we can do that in-house and it will save us money. And one of our new hires, uh, Jackie Brown, will be taking over the Facebook account and working with that. I know that I, I think last time I held up the brochure that talked about the tree walk. And that is something that's really exciting that's happening. And, um, and Eileen Pollan talked about that. And upon the completion, there'll be one last, there'll be three tree walks. And the last one will be the serpentine walk. So um, be ready for that. There's going to be a launch at the Nature Center. And now I put on, I have Joan's hat on, and Joan would say, now, Beth, tell us about Thrive. So now I'm switching over, and I'm going to report to you about Thrive. The Thrive meeting was on uh, July 18th. And where we're coming from is with Thrive, we're looking toward putting together more resources to be able to hand out so folks know about Thrive and know about the idea of communicating how great it is to live here and what are you doing that so that you are thriving and enjoying living in the village. So we're putting together posters and pamphlets and, um, and uh, Eileen Pollan's team is in charge of that. Also, we, we are going to be on, we have a Thrive TV program at 9.30 every Thursday morning on Village Television. We will now have Every fourth Wednesday, a person from our Thrive Committee will be talking and giving you an update on Thrive. And last week, I had the privilege of being the first person to do it, and it was out of schedule. But anyway, I was able to um, have an opportunity to talk about what is Thrive, and how did, how did it get started, and where are we now with it. And it's really, uh, it's, it's a task force that's really moving. We're working on the new resident video and getting more together and kind of updating the new resident video, outreaching to clubs with the Thrive program, and talking about having Thrive Talks, perhaps on TV. People just being interviewed and talking back and forth, maybe a group of people talking about what we enjoy about living here and what are, what are things that you can do in the village. So that is my Thrive Report. That's it. Thank okay. you. Next meeting. Next meeting. Oh, Joan reminded <laughs> me. So September. September. <laughs> I'm sorry. The next meeting will be Monday, August 20th. That's coming up pretty quickly, 1.30 here in the boardroom. And be sure to come. You, there, you learn so much in those meetings. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very you, much. Report on Mobility and Vehicles Committee, Director Troutman. Okay, on August 1st, the Mobility Committee met to address the following agenda items. The Charter Rule Review, which I'll mention in a minute, the Ride Now Planner Ride Scheduling System, and staff's response to the petition that was presented to the GIF Board on June 6, 2018. There were approximately 110 residents in attendance of that meeting, People were turned away since no standing room was allowed by the fire authority. 30 residents spoke to the petition that requested GRF bring back the seven-day fixed routes. Staff reported that, quote, the eight-route bus system was adopted as part of the 2017 business plan and would give us an operational savings of $250,000, unquote. In their opinion, this reduced route from 11 buses to eight buses would, quote, provide the same travel options, unquote. Well, 29 of those 30 residents did not agree that that's what's happening. 
The five-year capital improvement plan presented to the JF Board on April 3rd, 2018, was allocating $13,460,000 to improve Clubhouse 3. <laughs> Residents expressed disapproval of the board spending that much money on a building for functionality and decor. They pleaded with the committee, pleaded and crying. We had crying going on. The committee to spend some of that money for more buses instead, since so many are dependent on them for health and well-being. The new reduced system has caused great stress on the riders and their loved ones. Long wait times between transfers and pickups are not tolerated well among disabled." Unquote. One resident even quoted our mission statement that reads, Laguna Woods residents receive unparalleled opportunities to enjoy the utmost in active living. We are dedicated to improving and enhancing all that we offer to enrich our residents' lives. They feel that, yes, the PAC enriches our lives and gives us active enjoyment. So those of us who ride the buses should be given the same equal consideration when it comes to GRF spending our $198.57 that we contribute every month, unquote, from one of the residents. The committee chair has called a special televised M&V meeting for August 31st, 2018 at 9.30 a.m. here in the boardroom. The only agenda item on that special meeting will be the evaluation of alternative transportation options. We want to thank broadband staff, especially Paul Ortiz, for working so diligently to get that August 31st meeting televised. And now just a, a thing about the charter. As I said, we, we didn't read it all, but I just want to highlight a couple of the uh, things that are in the charter that are important. Um, number two, the committee serves as a liaison between the Golden Rain Foundation Board of Directors and the managing agent on all transportation issues. We review long-range plans prepared by the managing agent to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of the GRF transportation system with an emphasis on new and emerging technology, focusing on operational and energy efficiency and make recommendations to the board for final approval. We review major service modifications to the Laguna Woods Village transportation system that are proposed by the managing agent and those modifications are sent to the GRF board for approval. We review specifications recommended by the managing agents for procurement of GRF vehicles. This is important because we've been ordering vehicles that have um, imposed upon the residents that they all have to get a different size shopping basket. They went from like 20 inches down to 15 inches, and that has posed a stress for having to buy new baskets. And last couple of things. Um, we also review bus schedules, bus routing plans, or alternative transportation programs that are developed by the managing agent, and we provide recommendations to the managing agent that will ensure both a high level of service to the members and an efficient use of transportation resources. This is what the committee is supposed to be doing. And don't forget, our special meeting is going to be August 31st at 930 right here in the boardroom, and it is televised. So we hope, um, I think we're going to have an overflow room in case we have more than 110 people again. So thank you, and that completes my mobility report. Thank you. Item F, Report of Security and Community Access Committee. Director Soule. All right. Good morning, everyone. <clears throat> Here is the GRF Security and Community Access Committee update. <clears throat> as far as the gate access project, we are still on track to have all permits and contracts in place to begin installation of gate arms and security cameras at gates 1, 2, 3, 4, 7, 8, 9, and 14 in late August or September. However, during yesterday morning's VMS executive session, Ernesto Munez mentioned that the gate access project originally planned to begin in August, September has been pushed back about one month to September, October due to the extra time it's taking to obtain all the necessary permits and assign out the bids. The goal is to perform the work on two gates at a time until completed and then move to the next two. The first two gates have not yet been determined. However, residents will be given notice well in advance of the gate closures and alternative routes available. 
VMS staff will work with the city, sheriff, and fire to ensure effective traffic flow in and out of the village. Residents who do not who have not obtained an RFID decal are encouraged to obtain one for each vehicle. Otherwise, residents will be required to enter through the guest lane and show their ID card at all times. Golf cart registration. All golf carts must be registered with the resident services to obtain a golf cart decal and shared electricity decal if appropriate. This decal is specific to golf carts and is in addition to the GRF decal. Thus far, 1,062 golf carts have been registered with only 350 more to go. If you're one of those 350, please register your golf cart as security is now issuing citations rather than warning notices. Watch for golf cart training to begin. It was mentioned in the July breeze Chief Moy, along with the Mobility and Access Committee, are in the process of setting up rules and etiquette training for all golf cart owners. I'd also like to speak about contractors and the violations in the village. Basically, on contractor parking violations. I'm going to, uh, <clears throat> since I didn't have this prepared, so I can't show you the chart, I'm going to speak on this, basically. Um, Security started a full court press on the contractor parking enforcement in mid-March. And after a full month of enforcement in April, the citations have considerably decreased each month. Obviously, the word is getting out to both our residents and to the contractors. There's been a total of 296 for the year, and below is a breakdown by month. So in January, there were only five, and in February, there were five. March, when we started this, mid-March, there were 60. April, there was 84. May, there was 63. June, there was 48. And July, there was 31. So the word is getting out in the village. And I just wanted to make sure that people understood that this is being enforced. The next thing I want to speak on is vegetation removal project. For security and fire safety, staff will begin cutting back the brush on the south side of Ridge Route, east of the dog park starting on Monday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. for the next several weeks. Also, village safety. As is always the case during the summer months, the village experiences an increase in visitors and guests. As a result, residents are encouraged to take the extra precautions to secure their carports, cabinets, and especially bikes. A heavy-duty U-lock bike lock is recommended. Chains and cables are easily cut through and should be avoided. Remember, See something, say something. Immediately call security if someone is unknown to your area. <clears throat> there was no meeting in July. The next SCAC meeting will be held here on Monday, August 27th at 1.30 p.m. in the boardroom. Thank you. Thank you, Annette. Uh, Reporter traffic hearings, Director Gross. Yes, uh, please bear with me. <clears throat> this is gonna be kind of a little bit lengthy. And I'm sorry that half the, well, almost everybody's left. We only have three people. What I've requested from Whitney, our secretary, is that we have three issues <clears throat> on our program today that are very, very valuable. And I was hoping those people would take those items and place them off from the agenda and put them on the table there so we could give them to a property services. Those relate to the information on uh, contractors and subcontractors parking as well as the golf cart and golf car information. Chief Moy and I have just completed a video which will be coming out soon on that. Generally at the beginning of the year, we get a pamphlet like this that says, gives you all of the rules, regulations, and so forth and so on. However, you know, to get an answer to what, uh, what has been said before, about three months ago, it was very obvious that when we had the traffic meetings, that uh, most of them had to do with this parking by subcontractors. And we got to find out that of many of those, almost every one of them was because of renters and leasee people who did not have the information from the property owner. And they say, oh, we know nothing about it. Yet I've talked about this and we had it publicized on 6-13-17. So I want to save these items now. Uh, so far, we've had uh, for the uh, uh, notices of violations, so far 2,932. We've had 170 of them paid, 237 were suspended, 
36 people went to traffic school, and uh, 200, uh, 676 were completely eliminated, forgotten. What's really important is that when we have these uh, uh, traffic hearings, for instance, we had a total of 23 people at the meeting. 17 individuals were found guilty and six were found not guilty. Of those, the greatest amount was, again, contract to parking, stop signs, speed, parking on sidewalks. And that's very important that people do not park on the sidewalk because if you're in a go-kart or whatever, uh, you know, in a wheelchair, you can't get by, so you get out in the street and you get hit. So <clears throat> what we've done, because of this information, we've gone to property services and explained to them, would you please get this information out to the renters and leasee people, make sure that the owner gets that information out. And the last three areas we have on the, on the item, for instance, this is very important on the notice of contractors and subcontractors. Parking is only allowed on named streets. You are not allowed to park within numbered cul-de-sacs and manor parking lots. This includes service and personal vehicles driven by workers. You have to get this information. It's very, very important. And we're trying to put this information out. That's why I'm asking if the, even the three people here, if you'll remove that if you don't need it, along with the um, uh, security golf cart safety situation and the city's guard the golf cart information. What's happening is that we're trying to let people know for instance, we have a very scary situation. It says here specifically in this information, you cannot drive your golf cart on Santa Maria, Moulton, El Toro. Yet every day I see people doing it. <clears throat> Three weeks ago, a month, whatever it was ago, one individual driving a golf cart in the number one lane, which is at the divider section on Moulton. People drive 45 miles an hour. I drove over behind him to protect him. In, in people, this information has to get out. We have, like I say, this bulletin here from Chief Moy that's really good information. And if the people here don't need it, please make, save the copy. We're gonna try to, I'm gonna go to the city. Here's also from the city. It also gives you the routes that you can take, so forth and so on. I'm gonna go to the city and ask if I could get about 50 copies or get their permission to make copies of this particular item to put in the property services so the people have it. That would go along with the uh, rules and regulations that we have for golf cart facility. The, this is the rules and regulations. It's a consist of five, six pages. It gives you all the information that's necessary. This is good information. This is the one from the city. <clears throat> anyway, we're gonna try one more thing. I'm gonna see if Chief Moy can put together a program when people drive in here and, and on the streets for their safety, I would like them to consider something very, very important. We have a situation where when you come out of gate seven, for instance, you make a left turn, you get on the street. <clears throat> if you notice on the streets, they have circles in the cement. There are lines, there are squares. That is at the stop sign, at the white limit line. And what's happening is that people are parking two and three car lengths back. So that means when people come out to make a left turn to come in here, they can't get in. They have to wait for two or three different times. <clears throat> and at the left turn place, we have four circles. People, again, will park one up front, then two or three way back here. Please be aware of this. It's very important. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ray. Tom. Uh, Yes. No. Okay. Um, thank you so much for saying that, but I did have somebody bring up an issue about the uh, on low speed vehicles being also the golf cars. Now people have to understand what is a low speed vehicle. It can't go more than 25 miles per hour on a level paved surface and basically has a gross vehicle weight of less than 3,000 pounds. The most important thing is to know that <clears throat> it can only be operated on streets where the speed, the maximum speed is up 35 miles per hour. So a golf car can go on our course to play golf, but people really need to understand that needs to, they need to have a DMV license, insurance, and that golf car needs to be registered. That spells out exactly. All of that information you're saying specifically spells out 
where you can drive, where you cannot drive, and you absolutely need a driver's license. That's why I said we're trying to get them even from the city. Very, very informative. I, 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 un I understand that, but I'm, I'm reading this right here, yeah. and I understand what you're saying, but I'm saying some people, because they talk about golf carts, and some people who have golf cars consider them to be a golf cart. That's so correct. they have to understand that there is a difference, and they can't be running around El Toro where the maximum speed limits are over 35 miles an hour just because it is registered and they do have a license and they do have insurance. All right, I just wanted to bring that up and make sure that they understand the rules because some of us have been behind these vehicles as they're making a left onto El Toro and been extremely frustrated because they don't know the rules and they have these vehicles. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. You have a question over there? Yes. <clears throat> yeah, I've gone over this and I, I was confused because uh, on low-speed vehicles, they're saying they cannot be driven on city-designated golf paths, and at the same time, they're also telling you that you can't be driving Moulton Parkway, Del Toro Road, uh, sidewalk. Where, do you, where can you drive these things? It says specifically where you can drive them. Yeah, it but where? It spells out specifically on here. That's why I'm asking that we get these and try to pass them out to the people. For, <clears throat> for instance, it says, um, uh, across the city's designated golf cart crossing. Yeah. Low speed can yeah, be right. driven eastbound and westbound on El Toro Road between Avenida Sevilla, Laguna Woods Village, Gates 1 and 5, and the Valencia Center. On private property, CVC 2120115, homeowners association and private property owners may have their own low speed vehicle use regulations, including assess, license, and registration requirements. Please check with the appropriate parties prior to using a low speed vehicle on private property. Then it says here, where it cannot be driven on a city designated golf cart pass. It shows the map. There's a map here. You can and cannot park. Uh, it also says on El Toro Road, except for eastbound and westbound between Avenida uh, Sevilla, Laguna Woods Village Gates 1 and 5, and the Valencia Center, on Moulton Parkway, Santa Maria Avenue, or Ridge Route Drive, on any sidewalk on El Toro Road, Moulton Parkway, Santa Maria Avenue, or Ridge Road Drive. In the city center park, Ridge Route Park, place for pause, dog park, or what in Wilderness Prevention, Laguna Coast Wilderness Park. Oh, great. Okay, now that we've cleared all that up. Still uh, confusing. Beth? Um, so, Ray, that is the publication that the city has this been This is the out. one from the city. Okay. I would the like to suggest that we get that information to Chuck Holland and get that up on our website quickly. So that um, we've now alerted the golf cart drivers, and if we can get it up on our website, they can quickly get a hold of it. I hear you that you're going to run it off on paper, but if we can have it on the website, it might also be a good idea. Well, well I, I, now Chief Moy also has one, and that that is here. It's printed here, but we have to get the city's permission to get the copy of these to be distributed, so to speak, on, or for us to make copies. We have so, a map that shows where golf carts can go. And all I'm saying is we should have a map that shows where golf cars can go. It has this map in here. It is in here. It is? Yes. I'm looking at the one map. It says designated golf cart paths, not golf. Or here it is. I've got it. Okay. That's why I'm saying we need this information to be put out, but we have oh. to get this from the city. Okay. But so we also... What I was looking at... I I have not, a question. It's not here, that's why. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is golf. Course. No, no. It's, it's not in the agenda package. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know that we had that map. Yeah. We tried to get it in, but it was at the last minute. Whitney, you really worked hard to get all of this in. Okay. Okay. Yes. How many, how many golf cars do we have here? Probably don't know. Um, I have one. I have a question. I don't know. We, property services can I've tell never you seen that, one. that's all. We need to find that out. Yes, property John. services has that information. Okay, uh, on the low speed vehicles, it says low speed vehicles cannot be driven on the on the sidewalks of uh, Moulton or uh, El Toro Road and so on. I'm wondering how I would get my golf car from uh, Gate Five to the DMV.
I can't drive on the on the sidewalks, and I can't drive on the uh, street on the <laughs> on the street. So my problem is I have to register my vehicle, and I can't get it there to register with these rules. I but I have, seen, I have seen both cars driven on El Toro sidewalks and on, and on Molten sidewalks. Is there a problem? Yeah. What are they thinking? Okay. All right. Well, I think, Ray, you need to talk to Joan at a later date and try to work something Thank out you. and figure it out for her. Thank you. Right. Okay, report of Disaster Preparedness Task Force, Director Troutman. The task force met on Tuesday, July 31st, uh, 2018 at 9.30 a.m. There were 32 people in attendance, and that's more than we've had to date. Uh, Chief Moore reported that in the increase in recent fires in Southern California require a higher awareness from the residents. The task force will make more effort to inform the residents of the proper safety procedures in case of a community fire or smoke and or ashes from nearby brush fires. Uh, we'll get with Eileen Pollan and Joan Milliman to uh, put that in the breeze. We also address the potential need to open the care and reception centers, which are our clubhouses, when there is an excessive heat warning or nearby fires which leads to increased smoke inhalation and ashes. If there were ever an emergency that required individuals to evacuate, they would always evacuate outside the village. We would not evacuate you to our clubhouses. It remains clear that our clubhouses are not shelters. Gate 13 and 15 that are usually closed would also be open during an evacuation. We also discussed the fire avert devices, and these are those electrical devices that hardwire into your electric stove, not the gas stove. And when they sense your smoke or fire alarm going off, the device automatically turns the power off to your stove. It takes about 30 seconds for that to happen, but at least it turns it off. Sometimes there's some damage already done. Um, the mutual representatives will check with each of their boards about encouraging residents to invest in these devices. United was able to install them already since the mutual owns the co-ops. It was suggested that mutuals 3rd and 50 try to initiate a pilot program to uh, install them at the mutual's cost, but that's just something they have to discuss and get back with us on. Okay, Secretary. Oh, yes. We agreed to do an appreciation certificate ceremony, uh, which happened this morning for task force members that volunteered between the years of 1989 and 2016 prior to VMSI. Chief Moore presented those certificates this morning. Residents are also encouraged to buy at least one five pound ABC fire extinguisher for their manor. Uh, Joan, can you please add that to your um, five pound. Yeah, message for the fire extinguishers. Okay, we also had a motion to add an energy subcommittee. Right now, the task force has subcommittees, uh, radio communications, office manager, recruitment, retention, the GRF board, United board, the third board, mutual 50, and now we're adding a subcommittee of energy. Bert Maldau will report on energy information and equipment updates as it pertains to disaster preparedness issues and safety in the community. We had a request from the Garden Villa Club to change our name from Good Neighbor Building Captains to something less similar to Garden Villa Building Captains. The consensus was, was that it would be far too costly at this time to change all of our documents and training materials. So to show our concern, we were verbally refused to our good neighbor building captains as just good neighbor captains as much as possible as not to confuse the Garden Villa residents. Our good neighbor captain appreciation barbecue uh, will take place this year on August 28th, 2018 from 12 noon to 2 p.m. at Clubhouse 2. Volunteer sign-up sheet was passed around and if you, want, if you are a good neighbor captain, then you will be getting an invitation uh, that Chief Moore will be putting out, and it will be a reservation only. So look for that uh, reservation. 
Our next meeting will be September 25th. No, yes, September 25th. We meet on the last Tuesday of odd months. That is the end of my DPTF report. I, Tom. Thank you. Hi. Um, concerning disaster preparedness, the security and disaster preparedness, I just want to say that uh, in the uh, July Village Breeze, <clears throat> Gary Morrison, the United Treasurer and Finance Committee Chair, did a great job about inexpensive home disaster preventatives that are available at hardware stores. And Judith did mention the fire avert automatic stove shutoff that cuts the power to the stove when sensing smoke. But there's also moisture and leak detectors and alarms that emit a shrill sound when they detect moisture. The other thing that uh, disaster preparedness issues will be, of course, I've been speaking on this, the emergency generators that will be purchased for the gates and the community center for major electrical outages, and also uh, locks for the, locking, for the cabinets for where the emergency water is being stored. Thank you so much. And I just mentioned uh, I'd like to see you attend that the uh, block captain's uh, barbecue in, in August. Okay. That'd be excellent. Judith, I'm sure, will be there. Okay, future agenda items. We have none. That's director's comments. Mr. Matson, you first. Good meeting. Love it. Mr. Juhan. I'm impressed with the com uh, way we do the business around here. We don't cut it short. We don't make it long. We just make what's good. I also, the energy um, meetings have been terrific. Excellent. Thank you. Judith. Yeah, I just want to announce I was another victim of stolen mail this week. My son orders a lot of um, electronics from Amazon, and as soon as your package is delivered, they send you a picture of the package at your front door so you can identify. And he no sooner got that picture and came to tell me about it, it was within minutes, someone was racing up the stairs, someone had picked up that package within minutes after it was delivered and took off. We did call security and they actually sent uh, Laguna Woods Sheriff over there to take a report. Um, the person was identified as around a 35-year-old female with long brown hair, obviously not old enough to actually live here. But this information is good because uh, they, need, they collect that data and it helps them, um, what would they do, Ray? They, that information helps them look for, build yes, a case? They put out an information form, yes. They put yeah. out a bolo. A bolo. Okay, be on the lookout. because we had the time of day and everything, and it was definitely my doorstep because I, I recognize my plants. So just uh, watch your mail. Thank you, Judith. Diane. Um, I just want to remind everyone that we are having the uh, budget meeting tomorrow, and that you'll know that we're no longer talking about a $13 million project for the Performing Arts Center, that it is now we have $1.6 million that we've uh, allocated in the um, are appropriated in the past uh, years, and then we're going to add two million this year, and two million is in the budget for um, 2021. And that's it for the. I've seen the 30-year plan, and that's it for the 30-year plan. That's the renovation. Meanwhile, so so I understand that there are problems with the bus system, but in that 30-year time, we spend 2.2 million dollars a year on. Uh, running, operating the bus system. So we will have spent $67 million in that time running the bus system, plus what we've spent purchasing the buses. And so what you have to remember when we're spending money out of our, on, on our facilities is that these are our facilities that we make changes to or make improvements on or make upgrades to once in many years. And so we have to make sure that we don't shortchange them too much because um, it's not going to run, come back around for a remodel again, again in many years. And I know that I'd also say in 2019, we do have $440,000 uh, out of our reserves uh, for, um, for four buses. And then we also have money for some pass seven, I think, passenger vans. They may not all be for that tr uh, transportation system, though. Thank you. Ray? Uh, I do make sure we have uh, supply in Laguna Canyon. 
uh, Wilderness Park, Laguna Coast Valley. We have all kind of information as to fitness hikes and let's go hiking. We do this every month. It's at the front desk. If you need to make a phone call to them to get information on that, it's very easily accessible. And uh, it's uh, area code 949-497-8324. That's 949-497-8324. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Beth? I wanted to say that it was saddened me to hear that Tom will not be running again. He's done such a fine job as leader, leading this board, and um, I've enjoyed working with him. Um, second thing I wanted to say is about staff and looking at these meetings and seeing all the things that are happening in this village. The staff that works here are just on their toes at all times, moving, working, doing an absolutely fantastic job. And one of the things that kind of mirrors that is having, I've, I've had three years on the third board and now I'm on the GRF board. And when we were in the midst of the transition and a bit after that, I know Ryan out there will remember this too. This room was filled often. Maxine will, will attest to that. This room and the overflow room when we had meetings. And we have, we have some citizens that come to the meetings, and I wish that more would, but I have to say that I kind of think that it reflects that folks out there are happy with what's happening with uh, the staff and with the boards all working together in a really good collaborative manner. So thank you, one and all. Mr. Palmer. No comment. Annette. Hi, this is a, a comment I'd like to make about, uh, there's been an email that started circulating um, and it's basically the non-toxic Laguna Woods. It's to your health and the village golf courses. And it's about using uh, pesticides for the grass. And I'm going to ask everyone who's interested in this to please view the August 2nd uh, on YouTube video from lagunawoodsvillage.com. It's this day, 8.30 a.m. with Ken Goldberg, in which the United Director Maggie Blackwell was on there who addressed this issue extensively. She spoke very eloquently about this. And I do want to also say the cost of uh, what is recommended and everything else and how things here, it's totally been researched. She spoke with lots of facts and figures and all the things that this community is concerned with. I also want to say that I brought it up to Laguna Woods Village Men's 18-Hole Golf Club, and they are not going to be supporting the, position, the petition. Thank you very much. Bert. I would like to just further stress uh, the importance that people that have life-saving equipment um, and require uh, that that equipment operate even if there is no power uh, to, first of all, deal or consider battery backup for your equipment. It is critical. Secondly, um, for medications, um, I would suggest that you might want to keep a bag of ice uh, within your refrigerator. Uh, so that you have a sufficient ice at least for a couple of days in the event that the power goes down. It's critical. It's life-saving. Thank you. Thank you, Bert. Excellent. Excellent. Joan. Oh, yeah. I'm still here. I want to tell you what the experience was on this end. Uh, uh, being on the phone and listening and everything was so clear. Uh, but I had to buy Google Voice and Google Hangouts to do this. So if anyone has to be out here uh, on the phone again, you can call on Google Voice or Google Hangouts for free. And so I've been hanging out here for however many hours it's been and not had to pay anything. Thank you very much. Uh, I especially want to thank you, Judith, for taking over as secretary. Yeah. And I want you to, uh, if you would, send me an email of all the articles we need to get in, which I, uh, I, I've been writing down, but... I think it's important. Will do. And uh, I sent you um, an email about the Scriveners for the closed meeting, but Whitney and Whitney has that, uh, but I did send you one. It's a little late. Um, Beth, my gosh, 
I think you should give the media and communications report all the time. It was so beautiful. <laughs> and thank you so much. Thanks, it was a great John. meeting. I, I think we accomplished a great deal. Thanks a lot. I, too, would like to uh, thank Judith for sitting in for being secretary. And as a question, it dawned on me, Ms. Troutman, are you considering uh, notifying, making any statements about maybe your future? Uh, changes. Well, I just had a book about three inches big about the ethics of running for the city council. So uh, without breaking any ethical rules, I am collecting petition signatures to be able to put my name on the ballot for the 2018 Laguna Woods Village City Council. Well, hopefully I'm not uh, violating any ethical things, but I'll throw my hat to support you. Uh, and I think you'd be an excellent member of the Laguna Woods City Council. Judith, Thank you. Can you tell us when that election is? November 6th. Thank you. So, well, what, also, go ahead. Well, go where ahead. do we go to sign a petition for you? I have it on my person. <laughs> <laughs> so, Carrying it around. So all those people in I have, TV land. I have to have 30 signatures by Friday. Right. And I only have half. So she's not looking for a whole. It's only 30. Once you're done with 30, then you, you turn it in. Oh, you don't okay. have to get oh, 500. Okay. Yeah. That's excellent. And I. Um, it's been wonderful. You guys are all great. You've worked really hard, and we've done a lot of good work. And the biggest thing I think we have done, all of us, is work together. I know there's been some ups and downs, but we have continued to remind each other that the, the work of the board is more important than an individual. Recess. Great. Um,